Well, hello everyone and welcome. Today's webinar is entitled Global Agricultural Market Insights for 2023 and we have a couple of excellent speakers for you. Um, as is typical, I have a ha handful of housekeeping notes to go through. Um, the first is if you can hear my voice but you can't see your screen, you can exit the call and come back in. Sometimes that does the trick. Um, but if you have other technical questions, reach out to my colleague Lacey Edwardson and I'm going to post her information here in the chat, if I can pull the chat open. And um, in addition to that, um, this, this webinar is worth one credit in professional development. Those CEUs, if you're a certified member of our audience, that those CEUs, CEUs will be awarded to you um, automatically after the webinar is complete or after you finish the recording, if you need to exit early today. Please use the questions box. Um, I ask that you direct your questions to either Sue or Mark or both um, as appropriate, just to help us kind of filter out who needs to see which one or address which questions. Um, this whole entire recording or webinar is being recorded. So you'll have access to that. Just watch your email. And then again, we have a couple of events coming up yet this spring. Um, just watch our website a few things are in the hopper but we just start the final planning stages and so those notes will be those announcements will be made quite shortly um our moderator today oh oh before i get to that um the sponsor this webinar is brought to you free of charge through um, nutrients brand smart nutrition map plus mst so that's um just want to acknowledge that the sponsorship is solely just allows you to see this content uh, without any without having to pay okay so our moderator today is mike howell and joining him are mark tully and sudita mohapatra and they will be speaking on all the market things from last year and much more for this year uh, mike is a senior agronomist at nutrien he grew up on a university research farm and was involved in 4-h so he's had a lifelong interest in agriculture and still continues to be interested in um, making agricultural profitable for everyone. And add to that, he really takes pride in promoting educational programs as well. Mike has a bachelor's degree in soils and a master's degree in entomology from Mississippi State. So at this point, I'm going to make Mark the presenter and you can begin sharing your slides. And the three of you can take it away. Well, good morning, everybody. We appreciate you joining in for today's webinar. I think we've got a great topic today talking about the global agriculture market uh, insights for the coming year. Uh, we have uh, Mark Tully with us. Uh, Mark is a global research uh, market manager at Nutrien. Uh, in this role, he covers the agriculture and fertilizer industry, including nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash fertilizers. Uh, Mark focuses on macro supply and demand trends driving the agriculture industry. Uh, Mark has worked at Nutrien for about six years in several different roles. And prior to his time at Nutrien, Mark worked across several other industries. Uh, Mark has a BA degree in economics from the University of British Columbia and a, a master's of science degree in economics from the University of Calgary and an MBA degree in business management and marketing from Quantech School of Business and Technology. And Sue Mohapatra is a senior analyst of global market research at Nutrien, where she covers agriculture market fundamentals. Uh, in her role, Sue focuses on supply and demand trends for key crop uh, commodities and crop protection inputs. Uh, Sue started working with Nutrien in 2022, and prior to her time at Nutrien, Sue worked in various roles in the uh, energy industry across India, the United States, and Canada. She has a BS degree in agriculture sciences uh, and a master's degree uh, in business, uh, an MBA in business. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sue. Uh, and Sue, uh, welcome to the program and uh, interested to hear your insights on these markets for this year. Thanks, Mike. Um, before we dive in, um, I, we will be making some forward looking statements. So here's the disclaimer up on the screen. And now we can start with the uh, agricultural market fundamentals. Um, we are now in a new calendar year with a new set of possibilities and opportunities. 
the winter of 2023 has been somewhat benign in many parts of the Corn Belt. Uh, however, at the same time, in South America, it is midsummer and crops are growing actively and being impacted by many weather anomalies. At the same time, grain is moving through different channels around the world in that unending journey to satisfy consumption. Keeping score of all of this is incredibly challenging. To start with, let's look at the global grains and oil seed stocks. Stocks to use ratios show the balance between supply and demand. Higher stock to use ratios mean more supply is available, while lower ratios suggest a tighter supply situation. Underproduction relative to robust demand has led to the lowest projected stocks to use ratio since 1996-97, driving food security concerns and supporting grain prices. Stocks have declined for six consecutive years, as you can see from the graph on the left, uh, due to lower production of grains like corn and wheat in the US, Ukraine, Europe, and South America. Grain markets are providing a massive incentive right now for growers to expand production, and we would expect to see that but the 2023 crops are not off to a great start. There is a growing recognition and concern that Ukrainian production will continue to fall this year as the country deals with the ongoing conflict. The Ukrainian Producers Union said yesterday that the corn acreage could drop 30 to 35% this year due to a shortage of funding for farmers and electricity blackouts. And the Ukrainian government is projecting wheat area to be down over 40% with a crop being planted now. The overall grain production and exports from Ukraine are projected to, to be down over 30% um, and 40% respectively in 22-23. Though the oil seed supply demand balance is in a better shape, but it is also more concentrated and so more at risk if there were to be a production issue. And given the high production in both the northern and southern hemispheres, the oil seed supply and demand is not as strong an indicator. Uh, Brazilian soybean acreage is projected to be up 3 to 4 percent in the current growing season with a projected record production. Uh, Canadian canola supply for 22-23 is estimated up from last year by 38 percent, but the rise in production is partly offset uh, by tight carrying uh, of stocks from the 21-22's drought reduced production. So, the so now taking a look at the U.S. crop stock to use ratios. Um, the U.S. corn supply and demand balance for 22-23 tightened compared to 21-22, mainly due to lower acres and yields. Um, in its latest supply and demand report on uh, January 12th, the USDA dropped corn production uh, by 200 million bushels for 2022 down to 14 billion bushels, which is the lowest in three years. The USDA also cut harvested acreage by 1.6 million acres. Harvested corn acres were primarily lost in uh, western states, including Nebraska, Kansas, and South Dakota, where drought had uh, hit hard this summer. U.S. national corn yield now sets at 173 bushels per acre. U.S. produced 4.3 billion bushels of soybean in 2022 with a lower um, harvested acreage and a lower national average of 49.5 bushels per acre. The yield reduction came mainly from lowering previous estimates in Missouri, Indiana, Illinois, and Kansas. Although the USDA anticipates supply will be less constrained for the new crop, domestic crushing and export shipments of US soybeans make up about half of all the use, and both show continued strength and increased demand. Now let's take a look at the uh, season average realized prices of the major crops. Since the January USDA report maintained tightness in U.S. corn and soybean balance sheets, uh, we can expect elevated price volatility in the months ahead. As it is start of the new year, the corn and soybean market will closely consider the relationship between old crop and new crop supply and demand conditions. South American crop production and weather news will be a major market driver in the near term, as a large corn and soybean crop in Brazil is expected to fill the gaps in global commodity availability left by a below average U.S. crop. U.S. corn prices remain supported by a historically tight supply demand forecast as a result of high prevented planting acreage in 22, 20, uh, 22 and below trend yields. Uh, lately, however, there's been some bearishness to go around corn due to continuing news about broad weakness in demand for U.S. corn exports, in particular, the competitiveness of Brazilian corn in the Chinese market. Seasonally, corn prices tend to peak in early June and bottom out in October. Uh, we would expect the market to continue to remain strong uh, through 
to attract increased acreage in 2023. The soybean complex is not quite like corn, uh, but we also uh, saw yield go down as well as acreage from the USDA. And we know the USDA lowered Argentinian soybean production down. And at the same time, we know about the big crop in Brazil coming up. On the domestic front, um, there are many crush plants being built in US to take advantage of the uh, biodiesel boom forged by US government policy. And so far, US has not raised US domestic crush to reflect this, but we can expect uh, this to increase in the next few years. Um, that is a significant demand boost for US soybeans. Uh, seasonally, soybean prices tend to peak in early July and bottom out in early October. Soybean futures are around the uh, $15 per bushel mark right now, supported by strong demand expectations, um, with China set to boost purchases in the coming months as the economy of the world's largest soybean importer reopened after the pandemic um, isolation. Um, meanwhile, concerns about supply disruptions have eased amid an improvement in Argentina rains and the early harvest progressing in Brazil. Wheat futures um, have risen and are hovering around uh, 7.5 per bushel from the 15 month low of 7.2 um, that was touched on January 24th as signs of improved macroeconomic sentiment from the largest consumers uh, have offset the abundant world uh, supply. Higher demand was underscored by a pickup in export inspections out of the United States, uh, but still a strong supply uh, limited um, uh, wheat rebound. Much needed rains in the major producer Argentina eased drought concerns and added to solid crop expectations. Uh, another significant exporter, Australia, forecasted its wheat crop to reach historical 42 million tons. Higher Australian wheat output comes at a time of stiff competition from the Black Sea region, where all-time high output in Russia is keeping the global market well supplied. And finally, cotton, cotton futures uh, were trading around um, uh, 85 to 86, uh, uh, up from the near 22 month low of 72 in late October, amid weak demand on domestic and international markets uh, triggered by growing recession fears. On the supply side, the latest USDA report indicated a projection for world cotton production in 22-23, marginally below the 2021-22 crop, as a slowdown in the global economy has uh, reduced cotton mill use prospects. Global exports are projected to be down by 2% in 22-23, uh, with US cotton exports forecast to account for nearly one third of the total. So overall, the commodity prices have been at historically high levels, and we expect this trend to continue into 2023, supported by tight overall stocks amidst steady grain and improving oil seed demand. Now, the South American current crop conditions, um, weather in Brazil continues to follow a familiar pattern, frequent rains in central Brazil with generally light rains in far southern Brazil. The forecast is calling for the rains to ease up somewhat this week in central Brazil, which would be a welcome news for farmers trying to harvest their soybeans. Um, with drier weather and more soybeans maturing, the harvest pace in Brazil should now start to accelerate. Brazil soybeans were 5% uh, harvested as of late last week, compared to 11% last year and 6% average. Uh, Mato Grosso, the top producer state, is most advanced at 14% harvested. Um, wet weather continues to slow the early harvest and the forecast is calling for more rain this week in central Brazil. At this point, it's unlikely to affect the size of the harvest, but the forecast does add to the concern. Um, first corn crop in Brazil is 8% harvested as of late last week, compared to 14% last year. Uh, estimates for Brazil's first corn crop have been declining due to poor yields, especially in southern Brazil, but the first corn crop only accounts for less than one quarter of Brazil's total corn production. The Safrina corn crop accounts for more than three quarters of the total, which is being uh, planted right now, albeit at a slow pace. Uh, we are already at the end of January and only 5% of the Safrina corn has been planted compared to 14% last year. Given the forecast for central Brazil, there may not be as much Safrina corn planted within the ideal planting window as had been initially expected. Uh, looking at Argentina, after months of drought, farmers in Argentina received the best rains of the growing season last week. Rainfall amounts were better than forecasted, 
but drier and hotter weather is forecasted to return to Argentina later this week and into next week. These rains did not end the drought in Argentina and more rain is needed, but they did help to stabilize the soybean crop. Soybeans are rated 54% poor to very poor, 39% fair, and 7% good to excellent. The good to excellent percentage is up 4% compared to the prior week. Um, the early planted soybeans are over 60% flowering and setting pods, and about 15% filling pods. The later planted soybeans are approximately 75% in vegetative development and 10% flowering. So all appears to be well in Brazil. Harvesting has started and while delays are present, uh, there's no meaningful threat to either gathering of crop or the planting of safrina corn crop prior to late February. Crop tours in Brazil confirm that a soy crop of 152 to 155 million tons is nearly assured. The additional supply will add to Brazilian exports and domestic crush, crush as Brazil in the recent years has shown no willingness to store more than 2 to 3 million tons in inventory. Um, next slide, please. So um, Brazilian growers continue to look to uh, boost crop production in the current market environment. Area is expected to be up in the 3% um, range for both soybeans and corn, but production could be significantly more because of the assumption of trend yields at this point. The last couple of years have had drought challenges, so a return to trend yields would provide a significant production boost. Over the past 20 years, the trend soybean area growth in Brazil is 3 million acres uh, per year, and the average over the past two years is close to double that. The other interesting thing about Brazil is that corn and soybean area growth are positively correlated, meaning that corn acres increases as soybean area increases. 76% of the corn in Brazil is expected to be planted as a second crop um, called as the safrina corn after soybeans are harvested in the current growing season. Now let's take a look at the global crop economics. The USDA estimates that 2022 net farm cash income was a record in real terms, close to 190 um, billion. From the growers' perspective, in terms of loan demand, farm credit conditions remain relatively strong. No doubt input costs have been high, but the strong crop prices have helped the growers offset the higher production expenses. Given the supply challenges in other parts of the world, uh, the focus on North American planting and crop development will be even more intense than normal given the heightened sensitivity of global food supplies to further shortfalls. Another positive thing for growers is that uh, the input costs are well below the year ago levels entering into spring of this year. So looking at the financial uh, health of the grower, the crop economics look very strong as a whole. And finally, uh, uh, the acreage projections. There is too much data on this slide here. Uh, the USDA long-term projections have put 2023 corn planted area at 92 million acres, uh, up 3.8% from 88.6 million that went into ground this year. The projections indicate an increase in acreage assuming preventive planting returns to average levels. We would expect a rebound in total acreage. There were 6 million acres of prevent plant in 2022, so more average prevent plant would lead to higher total acreage. Now, Brazil is looked upon as the world's insatiable breadbasket right now. In 2023 and beyond, it's being relied upon to make up everybody else's shortfalls. USDA has projected a 3% increase in soy acres and 4% increase in corn acres in Brazil in 2023. Wheat area is seen rising nearly 4% to 47.5 million acres. And uh, in the January report, USDA uh, increased the winter wheat planting. Uh, it was close up to 4 million acres. So overall, long-term future spreads um, uh, and the agriculture fundamentals are still telling a bullish story. That said, uh, we are going into a time where the South American crop size might define the story going forward. And as is always the case, uh, much uncertainty exists into the future. And with this, I will now pass it over to Mark, who will talk about the fertilizer fundamentals. Great, thanks, Sue, and good morning, everybody. Um, I think this is my my third time in a row here speaking to the the ASA in advance of a, a new calendar year and trying to figure out what's going on in all these egg and fertilizer markets. So it's great to be back and looking forward to the questions the group has. Um, I think this is the first time I've actually got to do this from an office instead of a basement in, at my house, so that's a pleasure. 
Um, I, I appreciate uh, what Sue went through here this morning. I think she's really laid out uh, the picture quite clearly around what's going on in the agricultural markets. And most particularly that uh, we're continuing to experience really tight um, supply, um, mostly in the grain sector. And as a result of that, we're continuing to see historically high prices for a number of crop commodities. And I think what I, Sue's laid out uh, for us here today is that when we put into the global picture of the challenges that continue in Ukraine, you know, the drought that parts of South America is facing, uh, the need for rebounded acreage in North America into 2023, is that ultimately um, it's unlikely that we're going to rebuild these stocks in just a single growing season, that we have a couple more growing seasons of you know trend yield and increased acreage that it's going to take to rebuild those stocks. And as a result, um, it creates a bit of a, a bullish narrative, as Sue would say, for the, uh, the ag commodity sector here, heading certainly into 2023. So with that, I think I'll dive into uh, the fertilizer markets for folks on the call and try and take us through the wild ride that was 2022 and start to talk a little bit about what we maybe see ahead for 2023. So starting with fertilizer prices, uh, you can see those charts on the left-hand side of the screen here for potash, nitrogen, and phosphate. Um, but ultimately, as we look back to 2022, and particularly the spring of 2022, we saw prices that we hadn't seen for the better part of a decade. Uh, as we think of a number of significant challenges that the marketplace faced, uh, constraining supply uh, across the world, you know, whether it was the sanctions against Russia and Belarus impacting potash markets, whether it was uh, the significant shift in global energy prices and natural gas that drove up the cost of production for nitrogen and shut down plants across Europe, or whether it's the, the trade policy, whether it's US CBDs or Chinese export restrictions that impacted the ability for the global market to access phosphate product. You know, across the board, we ultimately saw a lack of fertilizer supply. And that was paired with, I think, a need, quite frankly, to try and maximize yields globally because of how tight the global grain and oilseed stocks are. And, a drive up in fertilizer pricing, uh, particularly in the spring of last year. Now, what we have seen through the second half of 2022 is a buildup in stocks in that springtime because not all that product went into the ground because of some challenging weather. Um, and then a lack of buying in that second half of 2022, uh, simply because the import need wasn't there after all that purchasing in the spring. But what we're seeing as we head into 2023 is a real drawdown in those stocks of fertilizers. Um, again, a tightening of inventories across a number of key markets heading into 2023. And, but at the same time, uh, much lower prices as uh, the lack of demand that we saw kind of in the second half of last year has led to fertilizer pricing uh, coming down quite a ways from peak. In fact, in many cases, having versus where it was in the spring of 2022. Um, and I think in, in, in all respects, improving the affordability for growers as we head into the next planting season. So what we have here is some application economics for uh, the Brazilian grower on the far left. In the middle, we've got our US corn fertilizer uh, costs. And then on the right-hand side, we've got our Western Canadian canola costs. And so uh, that red uh, diamond is where pricing implies the application economics are today. And what we're seeing is a return to maybe more average uh, ratios for where fertilizer prices are relative to where the crop commodity prices are. Versus if we look at the, the end of 2021 or the peak of 2022, so that's that yellow and the dark blue lines respectively, um, we saw application economics that were uh, significantly uh, worse off than where they are today. And so as we head into 2023 with those tightening inventories, the strong crop commodity prices and the improved fertilizer economics, we do expect some pretty healthy demand uh, really across the NPK stream and, and really across a number of global markets. So I'll maybe dive into potash here to start. Obviously, the big story is what's going on with the former Soviet Union supply availability, and that continues to be constrained into 2023. Um, 
but I think first what I'll show here is where we see the development of demand and where demand was in 2022. And so when we look at these key markets, India, Asia, North America, Latin America, China, in basically every market we saw uh, a decline in potash demand in 2022, largely because the supply wasn't available for much of the calendar year. Um, our expectations as we head into 2023 is that demand is going to rebound to some extent across basically all of these major markets as not only more supply becomes more available, but the uh, affordability metrics improve, incentivizing those application rates. So in 2022, we think demand was somewhere between 60 to 62 million tons, uh, still waiting on all that import data to let us know exactly what shipments were. That's against the 2021 that was about 70, 70 and a half million tons uh, from a product perspective that went into the marketplace. Um, looking ahead to 2023, we're expecting uh, an improvement in shipments. Uh, our range right now is between 64 to 67 million tons. That's partly driven by increased supply from North American producers, uh, but also the potential for some additional supply, whether it be from uh, the FSU or uh, some other small players in the marketplace to try and improve the situation, quite frankly, that we saw in, in 2022 with how tight the supply and demand balancers got. This really is, I think, the story in potash and the most important one that we need to delve into here in understanding you know, how tight and the supply side of the marketplace has gotten. And really, we don't have a comparative situation historically in the marketplace where we've lost this kind of volume of tonnage in terms of available potash supplies. Um, the sanctions that were imposed against Russia and Belarus, uh, in part because of the, uh, the war in Ukraine, but also particularly in the case of Belarus, because of the actions of the Lukashenko uh, regime, uh, we saw Western governments and, and many non-Western governments really stop uh, working with those producers and, and sanctioning that product. Now, I think in many cases, a lot of those sanctions, particularly against fertilizers, have been lifted. Um, but what we haven't necessarily seen is the ability for that product to flow smoothly into the marketplace. Um, most impacted by the logistical constraints is Belarus, who's lost access to European ports and so they now have to rail all their product into Russia and try and use uh, whatever excess bulk capability is available in Russia to move their product around the world and quite frankly that's just limited. Um, so when we think of 2022 and we look at where the import data is, uh, we think Russian exports are down about 30% year over year in 2022, uh, which is uh, a pretty significant driver of that decreased marketplace that we saw. Um, looking ahead to 2023, we still think the market could be constrained from Russian producers by two to four million metric tons. Um, from a Belarusian side of things, they were much more constrained as a result of those logistical impacts to their ports. Um, they're down about 50% year over year in 2022 in terms of their total shipments. And in 2023, we think they could be down anywhere from five to eight million metric tons. And they, on the downside, we think they actually could ship less product in 23 than they did in 22. Reason for that being in Q1 of 2022, for much of January and February, uh, the former Soviet Union producers were able to access markets pretty normally. They shipped close to what they normally would in those months, which is each about a million tons a month. Um, looking forward into 2023 in that first quarter, for sure Belarus is going to be constrained and we think Russia will be as well, which is going to limit the product that got shipped uh, at the start of the year. And so we do think it's very possible that we actually see less product coming out of Belarus in particular into 2023, further tightening the market. Um, I think the big story, at least in potash from a demand side of things, was Brazil last year. And in the first half, it was how much can Brazil buy? And in the second half, it was how quiet can Brazil be in terms of purchasing potash? And so a real a tale of two halves in 2022. Um, on the left hand side, you can see the import pace for their three key fertilizer products in Brazil. So urea, MAP, and then MOP. And we see this 
particularly for MOP, this massive buying in the first half of the year that fell off a cliff in the second half as the marketplace tried to digest all of those inventories and looked at affordability and said, eh, I'm going to hold back. But on the right-hand side is where uh, the beginning stocks were in 2022 of these fertilizer inventories in Brazil versus where the year ended in 2022, so that lighter blue line. Um, so really where we're starting 2023. And ultimately across urea and map, we see a significant tightening in, in inventories in Brazil. And for MOP, pretty much flat, just about the same number where they started versus where they ended, even though they bought a whole bunch of product just in the first half of 2022. And so what we see is really that Brazilian market tightening up heading into 2023. And that need for them to return to the market, we have seen Brazil start to buy some fertilizers here at the end of 2022 and the start of 2023. And they're going to need to resupply uh, really for the balance of the year so that they can get ready for that next crop. And as Sue was commenting earlier, their acreage is going to increase again in 2023. They're going to be uh, required to try and increase yields year over year to really try and rebalance that tight global grain and oil seed stocks to use situation that exists today. So I'll pause there on potash, uh, but certainly welcome questions from the audience as we get to the end of this presentation um, and flip over to nitrogen. And I think the big story in 2022 on the nitrogen complex was energy prices and what that did to the global supply uh, availability, but also the cost of production um, across a number of key jurisdictions. So on the left-hand side, we've got uh, the energy prices sort of lined out there. It almost feels pointless to have uh, North American prices and Chinese coal prices on this chart because they're uh, warped by how uh, volatile the European prices were in that yellow line there. Uh, keeping in mind, Russia is supplied about 30% or a third of uh, Europe, Western Europe's uh, crude oil imports. Uh, they were a massive provider of natural gas to Europe. And so with the sanctions that were imposed against Russia by uh, the European Union and other European countries, um, that supply disappeared overnight and you had uh, prices skyrocket. And at peak levels, there were moments where prices were trading at over $100 per MMBTU in Europe. Um, so a dramatic, a dramatic change in the cost of production. At times last year in Europe, uh, you could be paying $3,000 to produce one ton of ammonia. Uh, and that resulted in pretty significant curtailments of production in Europe. Um, in Western and Central Europe, uh, throughout the balance of the year, at points in the year, we saw as much as 70% of production come offline. Uh, Kind of in the end of 2022 and the start of 2023, we suspect about a third to 30 percent of European production remains offline as they digest the volatility in gas prices. But there has been a major shift in the last, um, I would say, month or so in terms of gas prices globally. We've seen a real drop in, in pricing, uh, and that's driven by what's been a pretty mild winter for much of the northern hemisphere. And so the supply hasn't been drained uh, the way uh, maybe we anticipated in a normal winter it would be. Um, and so we've seen prices come off pretty significantly. Today in Europe, prices are you know, about 20 bucks an MMBTU for natural gas. That converts into somewhere around $700, $750 per ton of production uh, for ammonia production in Europe. So getting a lot closer to where we saw Tampa settle. Um, for the month of February. We may start to see some European producers come online, but I do think that the volatility in natural gas and it still being winter is preventing some of those uh, plants from restarting. And so that's something to keep in mind. The other piece that's important to keep in mind is Russian exports of ammonia um, have disappeared relative to history. Uh, and I'll show that on the next slide, but in combination, you know, about 20% of uh, ammonia, both upgraded and merchant ammonia, is produced in Europe and Russia combined. And so this tightness and volatility that we've experienced in 2022 in the nitrogen supply side 
um, very likely may continue into 2023, perhaps in um, you know a less uh, extremes than what we saw in 2022, um, but very possible that we continue to see some extremes as uh, I think the marketplace works to digest, um, you, you know, the loss of that Russian energy product. But at the same point in time, um, you know, Europe trying to transition away and find new trade flows and new supply and getting themselves prepared for, you know, a 2023 winter and uh, what energy access looks like going forward. And so this will be, a, I think, a continued to be a key story um, for the nitrogen complex in 2023 and a key price driver as well. And so just to maybe lay that out uh, for folks here, what does this actually look like on a cost of production and the, Europe being that kind of marginal cost driver in the marketplace for nitrogen production today? Um, those lines on this chart, the yellow, green, and kind of teal lines, uh, they're representing where ammonia prices are. And so they've started to fall now, especially with the Tampa settlement recently of just under 800 bucks uh, a ton. Uh, that's fallen pretty significantly. Uh, that gray area in the back is where uh, uh, European costs of production have been. So as we look back in 2022, like I say, at times we were spiking on a monthly average basis as much as 2,500 on a daily basis. It was over $3,000 a ton uh, during that peak period. Um, but now as we look ahead to the futures, it's kind of trending in that uh, seven to 750 range per ton. And we're starting to see those ammonia cost or prices start to fall in line with where that European cost is. So um, we saw a lot of trade flow changes, a lot of product being moved um, from other producers in Trinidad and North America, the Middle East and North Africa, heading towards Europe to try and uh, offset all that supply that was lost. Um, but at the same point in time, it's unclear, I guess, whether we're going to see all that supply get normal in Europe in 2023. And I would suspect with the volatility that we're seeing in, in natural gas and this um, ammonia costs and pricing coming in line again, that we may still see uh, some supply tightness in that part of the world and some trade flow shifts for 2023 as a result of that. I touched on it briefly there as I was going through the, the prior slides around the cost of production and those impacts, but there's been trade flow changes and there's also been um, governments who've stepped in and said, well, we're not gonna move product the way that we used to, particularly China. So on the left-hand side, we've got those Russian ammonia exports and historically, they've just exported north of about 4 million tons of ammonia annually. In 2022, they probably shipped no more than 1.5 million, very likely that they shipped under 1 million tons. And in 2023, um, you know, bit of a, a wild card. We're not 100% sure how that's going to play out. I think it's going to be uh, pretty key to understand how um, negotiations with Ukraine continue, particularly around the grain deal, uh, whether ammonia exports can get involved in that sort of a deal. To date, it's not. Um, the grain deal ends in March of this year, and so that's something we'll be watching to see what goes on with negotiations there. But if nothing changes, um, all of those exports from Russia have gone through the Black Sea historically and through pipelines into Ukraine. And so without access, or normal access to that logistical supply chain, uh, don't expect any major increase in, in Russian exports in 23. So they could ship maybe as little as about a million tons. If there's some sort of negotiations and things clean themselves up um, that allow those logistical windows to open up again, maybe we see uh, Russia exporting half of normal volumes in 23. Regardless, very unlikely we see them exporting at a normal pace in 2023. On the other side of the world, we've got Chinese exports. And so as fertilizer prices have increased, China has stepped in and said, uh, you know, we're going to hold off on exporting all this product. We're going to keep it in our borders for our growers uh, to try and alleviate um, some of the supply tightness that we might experience uh, in a normal uh, growing season. And so um, we've seen China about have their urea exports in 2022. Um, certainly don't expect major urea exports out of China really until after their planting season. So that'll be, you know, 
sometime in the spring of 2023 when we might start to see China shifting their mentality around exports. Uh, likely it would be post June when we start to see a normal flow of Chinese urea exports if that were to be the case in 2023. Um, I think it will be largely dependent on uh, you know, other suppliers in the marketplace and what that looks like, but also where prices uh, directionally go before China makes a decision around their exports. But like I say, they did cut their exports in about half and that did tighten the marketplace in 22. And like I say as well, without them involved in the first part of 2023, likely keep things a little bit tighter at the start of the year too. Um, I believe this is my last slide before we dive into questions, but I thought important here to talk quickly on what's been driving some of those phosphate marketplaces here, at least in the short term. Um, talked about the Chinese restrictions on urea, same deal for DAP and MAP exports from China. Uh, they have the same restrictions, and in 2022, their exports were about half of what they normally were. Again, expect their exports to be uh, significantly hampered at least through their regular planting season and maybe be assessed there for second half of 2023. Um, I would not suspect that we'll see normal shipments from China in 2023, but we may see an uptick versus 2022 levels, depending on the direction of pricing and China's willingness uh, if prices were to fall for them to provide some supplies um, globally rather than keeping it domestically. The other big driver certainly for the phosphate uh, complex was the cost of production in 2022 and you can see that during peak when you combine uh, the tightness that we saw in sulfur, the tightness that we saw in ammonia and the price points of those products uh, costs of production were significantly higher than historical norms and that was also a driver of uh, phosphate fertilizer costs in 2022. As we get into 2023, I think it's fair to suspect that we'll see elevated ammonia pricing relative to history. Um, I think we might see some volatility in sulfur pricing. Uh, you know, sulfur is largely um, a secondary output product from the production of natural gas and crude oils. And so with the challenges that exist in the former Soviet Union and the restrictions against some of those producers, we may see some short-term volatility in the sulfur complex in 2023, similar to what we saw in 2022. Uh, but it seems as though that supply chain has cleaned itself up a little bit. And so the pure peaks or the heights of where sulfur prices were in 2022, maybe not as likely to see in 23. And so we might start to see a little bit more normalization of this cost of production uh, for DAP and MAP fertilizers in 23. But I think it's still gonna remain elevated relative to history if we look at that chart from at least particularly 19 uh, through much of 2020. Okay, so hopefully that gives folks a good overview of what we're seeing in fertilizer markets, what we're seeing in ag markets. And I think at this point, uh, we'll turn it over to you, Mike, to let us know what sort of questions the audience has for us. Mark, we really appreciate you and Sue uh, giving us this information. Uh, we do have a couple of questions uh, that, that we wanna try to get answers to. Uh, Sue, the first question is for you. Uh, you mentioned the, the tight stocks and the high prices uh, for most of our commodities these days. Uh, what are some external factors that, that could influence the, the crop future prices you discussed, either positively or negatively uh, in the next few months? Um, so there are several factors that would be affecting the crop future prices. Uh, did I get your question right, Mike? You're asking about the crop future prices, right? That's right. Okay. So um, uh, first of all, the uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict, the ongoing conflict there, there we are, you never know there might be surprises coming from the Black Sea region. Uh, as Mark already mentioned, the Green Deal right now uh, is supposed to be in place until March 19 with a possibility of may or may not extending so that is number one factor but right now uh, in the short term uh, south american weather is going to be one of the most important factors everybody is expecting uh, a bumper harvest from uh, brazil uh, but the uh, weather has been um, uh, unpredictable uh, the drought in argentina has been the worst in 20 years the recent rains have 
eased out the condition a little bit, but not good enough to uh, help complete recovery of the hills. Um, the rains have also interrupted harvest of soybeans in Brazil. So uh, that and um, uh, and also the uh, export situation in uh, US uh, because of the low water rivers in the Mississippi River, uh, we saw uh, export sales of corn, soy and grains uh, declining uh, towards the end, uh, second half of the year and end of the year. Uh, but that situation is improving now. So uh, there are a lot of factors on the supply and demand side that would uh, affect the uh, grain markets. But overall, the trend uh, seem, seems to be uh, bullish, um, considering the historically high prices that we have seen in the last two years and the tight glo global uh, stocks to use ratios of the major crops, grains and oil seeds. Uh, we expect the prices to continue to stay uh, at high levels. Thank you, Sue. Uh, I want to remind all of our participants, uh, if you do have a question, go ahead and type that into the chat and we'll we'll get those questions answered. Uh, we do have one more question. Uh, this one is for Mark. Uh, Mark, you talked about the, the nitrogen plants that had been shutting down uh, around the world, primarily in Europe, uh, due to these high natural gas prices and, and how these prices are starting to come back down. But you you did indicate that as many as a third of those are, are still offline. Uh, any idea when these may be able to come back online? And is this lack of production going to affect the, the availability of nitrogen uh, this coming spring? Yeah, it's a great question. And one that, it, you know, you got to dive into to really think about, you know, why, why wouldn't these plants instantly come up with these much lower natural gas prices um, and I think part of it is just a short-term logistical challenge quite frankly a lot of those plants in Europe they're pretty old and it's the middle of winter and so bringing those plants up um, at that time of year is risky you you definitely risk damage to the plant or an unexpected um, challenge that leads you to being out for longer than you want to be I think also with these producers uh, particularly because it is the middle of winter in Europe You've got to ask yourself, do you see a line of sight with this natural gas and, and ammonia pricing that allows you to remain up for the balance of the winter? Because what you don't want to do is come up for, let's say, two or three weeks and then find yourself in a situation where I've just got to shut down the plant again because it, it doesn't make any sense. Part of the story as well goes back to the, the imports that Europe has um, been, you know, picking up for much of 20, second half of 2022, but very aggressively in the last couple of months of 2022. So they did import a lot of ammonia. Um, and so some of those plants that are not maybe up and producing their own ammonia are still dealing with uh, inventories of purchased ammonia that they imported, and they're producing some downstream products that way. And so they just don't have a need to be up and running. Um, in terms of when we might start to see those plants come back online, I would suspect uh, as we get into February or maybe the second half of February and March, um, as we start to exit winter in that time in that part of the world, and we start to get maybe a little bit better line of sight on natural gas pricing, we'll start to see those uh, producers in Europe get a little bit more confident and we're more willing to come up. Obviously, if we see a shift in the other direction, like things get really cold or not gas prices start to climb again, um, we won't necessarily see those folks make that operational decision. In terms of tightness from a, a spring perspective, I think if we're looking at North America, I think there's no question um, the S&D tightened in the second half of 2022 uh, for the nitrogen complex in North America. There was a lot of U.S. exports uh, to other parts of the world. Um, there wasn't as much importing into the U.S. Uh, we had the, the river challenges at the end of 2022, which I think are starting to get themselves cleaned up now. Um, but I think from a, a spring perspective, yeah, there's the possibility that things are a little bit tighter than normal. And so there's the possibility that there's some challenges. But I think the one thing to keep in mind with North America as well is that there's a number of producers in North America. Natural gas and energy prices in North America have been at the lowest uh, levels of the cost curve all through 2022 and continue to be quite low today. 
And so I think we've got lots of producers that are going to be able to supply the marketplace domestically. Um, but at the same point in time, right now, it feels as though North America is the only key source of demand for nitrogen products today. We're not seeing buying happening in Europe. We're not seeing buying happening in Asia. The Latin American markets haven't really stepped up yet. And so a lot of uh, tradable product is heading to NOLA right now. We're seeing that, I think, in these sort of the big volatility and big swings in prices that we're seeing at the at the New Orleans import marketplace for nitrogen today. So I do think that there's lots of supply coming into the U.S. marketplace right now. We've got the domestic producers, so I'm not necessarily um, thinking that the marketplace is going to be short millions and millions of tons, but timing is always key when it comes to spring. And so there's certainly that possibility with how much was exported at the end of 2022 that we're maybe a little bit tighter than normal. Okay, and another question for Mark, uh, which are the main markets for Russian and uh, Belarus, ammonia and urea? Um, for urea, uh, for Russia, a lot of that product was sent to Latin America. They're not really having any product shipping uh, Russian urea product today. Some of it uh, certainly was for the North American market as well and the US market. Um, some of that is coming in for sure. It's not coming in at maybe historically normal volumes, but it is getting to the marketplace. Um, Belarus is not a nitrogen producer, just potash. Uh, for, from a potash perspective for both Russia and Belarus, uh, Latin American, North American markets and European markets were all key. Um, they've lost access to European markets almost in entirety. They're shipping product to Latin American markets for sure. Um, they're shipping lots of product into Asian markets today. Uh, Russia is still moving some product into the U.S., um, but Belarus has been completely unable to ship any product into North America uh, since about February of 2022. Um, so that's sort of where we're starting to see those supply imbalances come. Uh, from an export perspective, like I said, from a ammonia perspective, Russia's down probably about 3 million tons. Uh, their urea shipments are probably close to normal, but for potash, they're down about 30%, and for Belarus, shipments are down about 50% year over year. So that's where we're starting to see some tightening on the supply side for those products. Hey, uh, and Mark, we have another question for you. Uh, the question is, what will happen to the market share and price of alternative fertilizers like slow-release urea, uh, in 2023, do they have uh, do they have chances to go mainstream and complete and compete with the traditional fertilizers? You know, I think that's a, a an interesting question. I don't know that per, specifically in 2023 we see this step change of demand for um, specialty fertilizers. Um, especially because I think fertilizer prices remain historically high relative to much of history, although they are down quite a ways. So I think the grower is going to be um, very cognizant of the amount of money they're spending on fertilizers and where that portion of their balance sheet is going. And so they may be somewhat hesitant to invest heavily in um, all specialty fertilizer products. That being said, um, the appeal of a slow release nitrogen product not only because of uh, the, the potential um, ability to put less on the field and save a few bucks, I, I think we're entering this space from a sustainability perspective where there's just more and more, um, I think, energy getting into ag agriculture from the emissions. And a big part of those emissions are certainly from uh, nitrogen coming from the soils. And so I think there may be more uh, growers who are looking at that as an option um, when you think of the sustainability factor that it has available to it. Uh, and we may start to see, you know, uh, I, I think governments and the USDA and other uh, farm bodies get more engaged with that type of fertilizer product as well and recommending it or, or providing incentives to using that kind of product. But I think those sort of trends are maybe a longer term and not necessarily acute to 2023. And Sue, uh, we have another question for you. Are there 
any particular mathematical or statistical models uh, that, uh, that appear useful for uh, predicting prices? <laughs> uh, I hope we had a crystal ball that could tell us what to expect in the future, but unfortunately we don't. We just rely on the historical trends and the global uh, geopolitical and supply demand factors that could be affecting the prices. But uh, but no, we, we just use the statistical data that we have from the past to, to, to just project the uh, trends going forward. Um, uh, but we do, there, there are a lot of um, uh, variables, so there is no such specific model because it is just not one or two factors that could decide the prices and these variables keep changing every now and then. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, South American weather is one of the key drivers right now uh, and how the crop situation uh, 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 continues to be in the major growing regions, um, how the uh, major consuming uh, uh, consuming countries uh, behave uh, geopolitically, uh, the, the ongoing conflict situation so and the inflationary pressure, fears of recession. So there are a lot of variables that affect the uh, projections. It's a very dynamic uh, uh, modeling that I would say, but um, nothing that is static or uh, specific to it. I'd maybe just add to that one quickly, Sue. And I think you lay out some really good points about this particular marketplace and the volatility that exists, specifically about the geopolitical environment. And that's a, an impossibility to call, and it's going to certainly have a major impact on prices whether it's this calendar year or the next. Um, but one uh, factor that I think historically has been pretty correlated to crop prices, particularly grain prices, is the stocks to use ratio. And as we see that stocks to use ratio tighten, I mean, the correlation with higher prices is pretty consistent over time. And so, although not a perfect projector of let's say it's going to be this particular dollar value, I think it's fundamentally a very good signal of you know, where we would expect prices to go directionally. Yeah, I, I also forgot to add one uh, thing that has been historically different now than it was before is the um, rise in biofuel demand uh, that feeds into the uh, food feed complex. Uh, and with the uh, increased uh, regulatory support from the governments worldwide to increase the uh, biofuel production and consumption, that also uh, plays out as a major factor. Okay, thank you both. Uh, we do have several more questions here. I think we're going to make this one the, the last one that we're going to have time to answer uh, live online here, but uh, any other questions we get, we'll try to get uh, answers to those and post them along with the link to this video so you can go back and check those out later. Uh, but the last question, uh, Mark, is if China decides to release some fertilizer back into the international markets or if they decide to increase grain purchases from North America, uh, what type of effects are we going to see from these types of actions? Yeah, so if China increases their grain purchases from uh, other markets from an import perspective, uh, I think we're definitely going to see additional tightening on the grain S&D and the oilseed S&D. Um, China's thrown out their uh, zero COVID policy and it seems as though they're opening up their market to some extent and uh, there's been some indications that their uh, economic environment is maybe a little bit healthier than some of the more bearish attitudes that were uh, floated around at the end of last year um, regarding their economy. And they may end up being a little bit more uh, active in the trade marketplace than we maybe would have thought at the start of 2023, um, which I think is a positive underlying factor for demand globally in 2023. Um, but yeah, to summarize, if they were to get more aggressive in the grain or oil seed marketplace uh, from an import perspective, I think that would certainly tighten things and lead to potentially higher pricing. Um, on the flip side, if China was to start exporting uh, a lot more fertilizer supplies, um, I think we would potentially see some soft, more potential softness in urea and DAP, MAP if they were to get more engaged in exporting. But the thing I do want to highlight again is that there's really no reason for China to start exporting in large volumes until after they're done their planting window. Food security is the top priority for the Chinese government and the Chinese populace at this stage of the game. And uh, 
reducing their fertilizer supplies ahead of their key growing season is something that I don't think is a policy decision that that government would be willing to take at this time. So I think it's something that we would maybe look forward, uh, you know, in the second half of 2023 and understanding where um, fertilizer prices are at that point uh, for the Chinese government to start making decisions about whether they continue uh, restrictions on fertilizer exports. Hey, I want to uh, thank Mark and Sue for giving up their time today and helping us understand these uh, global uh, market insights. Uh, I want to thank all of our participants for joining in. I hope we uh, brought you some valuable information that you can use in your uh, business. Uh, and I want to remind everyone that we do have a few more questions and we will try to get these answered and posted uh, with the link to this video uh, later on uh, in the next few days. Uh, thanks a lot for joining in. See you next time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, everybody, um, particularly my my three guests here and everyone else that's attending the webinar and, and then those of you who maybe are watching the recording in the future. Um, yep, we have a number of questions and they keep coming in. Um, and as I close it up here to send them in, um, I'll just ask you three, Mike, particularly, how should our attendees reach out to you? Is there a website that you'd recommend or anything else? Yeah, I mean, no. you can also follow up and we can provide that later. but. Yep, uh, you can go to, to our uh, website, that's uh, nutrient-economics.com, and that's economic with a K. Uh, you can find a lot of our contact information there. Uh, send us an email or, or a phone call. Perfect. Excellent. Yep, we, that's, a, that's a very often question I get asked, so I just want to double check with you before we closed. Um, all right, well, that wraps up our hour. Thank you very much again for sharing your, your insights from this previous year and looking ahead. and. Um, that's about it, I guess. That's all we have time for. So thank you very, very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, you too. Bye-bye. <laughs>